Zato se radi s ovim historijskim, teorijskim traživanjima odnosa metode i kriterija valorizacije umjetničkog polja odnosu na šire političko i ekonomsko polje, znači ideološki odnosi, koincidencije, razlike, geografske i historijske specifičnosti i slične stvari. Znači sljedeće predavanje će biti u 10. mjesecu ili 11. O tome što bi to dođeš. Dobro, se ođeo. Dajmo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marco. Thank you, Mama. Thank you all for coming. Um, my paper is called The Art of Capital, Artistic Identity and the Paradox of Valorization. Um, Marco invited me to talk to a kind of project about valorization and art. So I'm not an artist, first confession. Um, I'm a theorist, second confession. Uh, so what I aim to do in this paper is to kind of set out uh, the problem of valorization, or what I call the paradox. Um, and this paradox is simply stated, I think. Uh, I'm going to do it in one order, but you can do it in the other order. On the one hand, the artist is the most capitalist subject. The one who subjects themselves to value extraction willingly and creatively, who prefigures the dominant trend lines of contemporary capitalism, precarity, flexibility, mobility and fluidity. The artist is the figure of contemporary labor, the most extreme instantiation of the present, and hence the one whose self-valorization is most plugged in to capitalism's self-valorization. <clears throat> On the other hand, the artist is the least capitalist subject, the one who resists value extraction through an alternative and excessive self-valorization that can never be contained. In their work, they prefigure non-capitalist relations of the refusal of work and creativity and play. To do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize or make art after dinner, just as I have in mind without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic or artist, in Marx's well-known words. The artist then, in this case, is the decoupling of valorization from capital, the figure of another form of wealth detached from the dictates of commodification. The classical resolution of this paradox, derived from Marx's analysis of the position of the proletariat, is to argue that the most capitalist subject is the least capitalist subject at the same time. The one who is most subjected to capitalism is in the position of the one who prefigures the exit from capitalism. Again, to use the language Marx uses to refer to the proletariat, those with radical chains are the dissolution of class society because they suffer a general wrong, and so also suffer the complete loss of man that can hence uh, win itself only through the complete rewinning of man. Uh, Ranciere, who I'll come back to later, remarks that this inscription of emancipation in the logic of development predicates it on the subject's impotence and disempowerment. The one who's in the worst position becomes the one in the best. And implies a culture of distrust, he says, based on a presupposition of incompetence. For this reason, and for others, notably the historical failure of this dialectic to take place, this way of settling the paradox via a version of historical necessity is no longer widely held, except perhaps by Antonio Negri, who will also talk about. Uh, no longer held for both the proletarian and the artist. The alliance of the artistic avant-garde with the proletariat, but as complex and sometimes imaginary, although sometimes real, as this was, now seems definitively ruptured on both sides. We witness a broken dialectic, and the dominant trend appears to be that the artist, as proto-communist subject, as one half of the path to an artistic communism, in Stuart Martin's phrase, has strayed off onto the path of artistic capitalism with little means for resistance. This, I would say, is the story today, at least amongst theorists of art. It's this story I want to tell uh, to probe the contradictions and tensions of the narrative and to consider more precisely the problem of valorization and self-valorization that runs like a red thread through it. I'm certainly not supposing or proposing a solution to the paradox of uh, valorization, which is a shame, because it'd be nice to have a solution. <laughs> <clears throat> but rather interested in considering what we might call the aesthetic and political figurations of this problem, 
and the possibility of our grasping and assessing the limits of those. And in particular, I will be focusing on the three, as I, at least as I take it, dominant, critical and theoretical articulations of this situation, Negri, Badiou and Jacques Rancière, so the main part of the paper. So firstly, uh, Negri. Uh, in one of his letters on art, written on the 1st of December 1988, claimed to be written, Antonio Negri remarks that art has always anticipated the determinations of valorization. So it became abstract by traversing a real development, by creating a new world through abstraction. What Negri econ economically indicates is the equivocation of valorization and the complex role of art within and against the unwinding of that process. In this case, he suggests the plunge of art into abstraction during higher modernism anticipated new forms of capitalist value creation, the determination of production through the deepening of real abstractions. So artistic abstraction predates and prefigures real abstraction. Of course, the paradox of this position is that the artist appears to run ahead of capitalism, but only to prefigure it, to be captured by it in advance. And in this way, the self-valorization of the artist, their act of creation, anticipates capitalism's uh, self-valorization as an automatic subject. Now, of course, this can lead to the well-trodden paths uh, of anxieties concerning recuperation, or even the trope that Christopher Connery has called always already co-optation, in the sense that any critical move you make against capitalism is preempted and contained uh, before you've even kind of made it. In this case, the artist's self-valorization is absorbed into capitalism, and so rather than there being a tension between the artist and capitalism, we find a collapsing of functions. This is what people call aesthetic capitalism. This is the thrust of Boltanski and Chiapello's argument that aesthetic critique has fallen prey to capitalism, has been internalized by it as its modus operandi. In fact, and I think actually more interesting, the work of the American Thomas Frank, notably his book The Conquest of Cool, had already traced a disturbing narrative, at least disturbing to me, uh, in which so-called countercultural tropes of artistic self-expression, liberation and play, the whole kind of American 60s, were already being deployed by American advertising and business in the 1950s and 60s. So here we're not really talking about recuperation, but a parallel discourse, in which advertising men behave like artists before this was supposed to be kind of normal. So in these cases, artistic self-valorization collapses, or becomes no more than another sign of the emergent neoliberal tropes of the self as enterprise machine, to use Foucault's phrase. Now, Negri doesn't accept this. He says that there are competing forms of valorization. Uh, working out of the tradition of Italian operismo and autonomia, he holds that capitalist valorization is always dependent on living labor as the generator of value, and so the worker can exceed the sucking out of value through their own proletarian self valorization of so competing forms. Uh, what emerges is a conflictual schema as the self-valorization of capitalism finds itself parasitically dependent on the working class, which can then develop its own excessive self-valorization as a rupture with the value of form. Transferred to the domain of art, we find that art anticipates new modes of capitalist self-valorization, but this doesn't mean that art is merely anticipatory, a kind of laboratory for capitalism that always recuperates its inventiveness. Rather, art for Negri promises a traversal, an excess, and a rupture with the schemes of valorization through a kind of super valorization. Uh, while Negri concedes to the usual tropes of the 1980s as a time of the dominance of real subsumption, the increase of real abstraction, and the falling away of use value, which can be found in a number of thinkers, and especially thinkers on art, he doesn't simply concede to pessimism. Rather, the artist can reveal, quote, a truth of abstraction. And he argues, we have to live this dead reality, this mad transition, in the same way as we live prison, prison, as a strange and ferocious way of affirming life. So we don't simply have the situation in which capitalist valorization parasites artistic valorization, but rather the possibility of a traversal or excess, as artistic valorization is the one side of an excessive self-valorization of labor power that capitalism parasites on, but cannot exhaust. 
The process operates, according to Negri, through an uncanny reversal. Quote, there where the abstract subsumed life, life has subsumed the abstract. Art's rendering life of life as abstract anticipates capitalism's real subsumption of life into the abstract, and in doing so, eliminates the possibility to, quote, find spaces where poetic self-valorization might preserve a corner of freedom for itself. But rather uh, than this loss of a little corner of freedom being a defeat, as we would normally think, the penetration of capitalist abstraction to all realms of life generalizes life in abstract, creates or relies upon an excess that the great works of abstract art also prefigure. So in a way, total subsumption turns around. It appears that art is, is prefigured and capitalism totally captures it, but at the same time, the abstract becomes alive with this force of labor power. Uh, so this prefigurative, prefigurative function of art captures both sides of the paradox. The emergent forces of capitalist abstraction and the possibility of exceeding or developing those forces beyond the fetters of capitalist control. In aesthetic terms, the artist of the present can harness and engage with these mutational and monstrous powers of the abstract that have become the property of the multitude. Taking the argument that capitalism generates a general intellect, the productive powers of communication and cognition, we could add for Negri that capitalism develops the general artist. Uh, and this is the later argument that he develops in Empire, the, the worst books, uh, in my opinion. Um, what's interesting in the 1980s moment, obviously, uh, for me, a moment of horror myself, um, is that Negri is more aware of the experience of defeat. And he offers a different suggestion about the role of the artist, including the artist as tracing this truth of abstraction. And in particular, a register that's oddly like Lukács, which is quite surprising uh, when you think of Negri, the possibility of what he calls a realism of the abstract. And Negri even argues for a, quote, punk constructive realism, uh, which sounds to me like an interesting possibility, uh, but it's kind of sacrificed at the altar of the powers of the multitude. Uh, I'm going to come back to that possibility at the end. Uh, and I think it adds something to the usual reversibility solution, that is, the Negri's answer to the problem of valorization. Okay, so that's Negri. And uh, now I want to talk about Alain Badiou. Now one of the interesting things is that despite the fact that they uh, hate each other uh, to one other, or lesser extent, at least that's what people tell me, uh, uh, Negri and Alain Badiou, or hate each other, they violently argue with each other. Negri and Alain Badiou share quite a lot in common uh, in terms of diagnosis, starting points and aims. In terms of the analysis of art, we could say that this is particularly clear in their common affirmationism. Their affirming of the powers and inventiveness of art. And also their acceptance of the power of capitalism to capture and control this inventiveness. Of course, the key difference is that Badiou rejects completely Negri's contention that the powers of capitalism are merely the powers of the multitude displaced or misplaced. A position that Badiou regards as, quote, a dreamy hallucination. Uh, in fact, in Logics of Worlds, Badiou's sequel uh, to Being an Event, he singles out Negri's analysis of art as the site in which Negri embraces the logic of contemporary capitalism, what Badiou calls democratic materialism, <clears throat> that there are only bodies and languages. It is the concern of Negri to fight on the terrain of capitalism, <clears throat> excuse me, and notably its effects of real abstraction, that for Badiou turns his theorization into an ideological apologia for capitalism. In fact, we could add, and I don't think Badiou would disagree, that Negri's modeling of vital and excessive powers flatters capitalism, especially at the time of which we're living, of devalorization and crisis. So what we can see then is a shared narrative of the power of capitalism, that's something they both agree on, but very different conclusions drawn about the role of the artist. There's a similarity that Badiou and Negri also valorised the moment of high modernism in the 1920s and 1930s as the moment of invention. But Badiou does not uh, coordinate this with a prefigurative function. Instead, in a kind of weird way, that's weird to me, uh, Badiou runs together a whole range of modernist artists and positions together 
uh, arguing that they attest to what he calls the powers of monumental construction. Uh, and this power is separate from the power of capitalism. It's this power, he claims, that has been lost in the embrace of, quote, the delights of the margin, of the bleakness, of infinite deconstruction, of the fragment, of the exhibition trembling with mortality, of finitude, and of the body. Which is what he thinks and agrees to, of any kind of postmodernism in a general sense. <clears throat> if we align this analysis with the schema that Badiou develops in the century, we can argue that we have passed into the saturation of the avant-garde and the passion for the real that he identifies with the revolutionary 20th century that dates for him from 1914 to 1989. He argues that in this sequence there is a common vitalism, theme of the conference of the weekend, uh, which emphasizes the heroic powers of will and the body and that contests the value regime of capitalism. Although Badiou doesn't draw this conclusion, I think it's logical to unfold it from his position, we can argue that our present is the saturation of this sequence in democratic materialism. Whereas the passion for the real uh, once animated collective bodies of the avant-garde and political avant-gardes, and of course beyond that, we could say that a figuratively degraded passion for the real now focuses, uh, finds its locus on the suffering of the individual body. So we can see a kind of involution of the passion for the real. What was once associated with the avant-gardes and political vanguards has now kind of degraded itself into this kind of narcissism, uh, self punishment and self-exhibition. Badiou's answer to this problem then is subtraction. It is only through the subtractive power of art that we can uh, uh, escape uh, the capitalist valorization. The artist must construct what he calls an independent affirmation. Unable to rely on the encrypted powers of liberation secreted within actuality, Alain Negri, Instead, the artist must refuse the horizon of the present to break with the dialectic of valorization. In Badiou, this working of subtraction takes its inspiration from high modernism, but a high modernism split into two. We have to break off from the passion for the real animated by destruction and the bad infinity of the relentless attempt to track the real outside of representation and trade this for the subtractive excesis evident in a work like Malevich's White on White. Go from grand, uh, destructive passions to these kind of formal differences between white and white. Uh, it's this modernism which uh, traces a pure minimal difference to use bad use. Uh, now the key difficulty, as I pointed out before, it's probably obvious to everyone, is that uh, it's difficult to imagine how that, that process is going to be recaptured and we reworked in the present. It's the very power of capitalism that seems to debase any monumental construction, even of this minimal difference, in advance. And Badiou notably has very little to offer in the way of examples or instances of contemporary art or artists who measure up to the criteria of probing a subtractive minimal difference. So it seems like it's a possibility, but it's nowhere present. So then if for Negri, uh, everyone is an artist, uh, for Badiou, no one is, or no one should be. The last thesis of his third sketch of a manifesto of affirmationist art is, it is better to do nothing than to work formally toward making visible what the West declares to exist. Now, in some ways I'm quite sympathetic to this advice. Uh, it's not necessarily bad advice in the time of the hyper-production of art, <clears throat> nor in the increasing integration of art and art practice into the circuits of the market in the state, even in a kind of period of crisis. Certainly in the UK, it's really integration of art and creative practices in education it seems to be dominant in our, in our culture. This turn of, to practice as kind of, uh, education. <coughs> so, uh, so the result is that monumental construction seems to be firmly a thing of the past. Such a risk is further reinforced by Badiou's own theorization of contemporary capitalism in the form of the ideology of democratic materialism. This contention and logics of worlds that we live in an atonal world seems to leave the purchase of any subtractive orientation moot. As he puts it, empirically it's clear that atonic worlds are simply worlds which are so ramified and nuanced, or so quiescent and homogenous, 
that no instance of the two and consequently no figure of decision is capable of evaluating them. This lack us, condemns us to an effect of disorientation, or if we take Badiou's remarks on subtractive politics as a model for thinking art, stuck with trying to construct enclaves that are somehow resistant to the overweening powers of capitalism. So there doesn't seem to be any space in this atonic world to actually kind of do anything. It's almost so powerful. Uh, it seems to be no way out. So I'd suggest then that there's a kind of symmetry between the two uh, failures or points of tension in Badiou's and Negri's work. Whereas Negri seeks redemption in the reversible power of capitalism, that is for him merely the displaced power of the multitude, and so risks simply confirming the power of capitalism. You know, if everything around us is really our power, displaced, it doesn't seem to get us anywhere really. Uh, Badiou seeks redemption from this power through subtraction, and yet cannot identify that possibility anywhere. So on the one hand it's everywhere, and on the other hand it's nowhere. Uh, both to me seem equally problematic. Power is at stake, but uh, kind of counter power, but everywhere seems lacking. <clears throat> the very dominance of artistic capitalism seems to be the sign of art's prospective power, but it never seems to be able to take the next step into artistic communism. Okay, on to Ranciere. It's just these kinds of narratives of increasing abstraction, of real subsumption, of the dominance of the society of the spectacle, and of the erasure of use value at the expense of exchange value that Jacques Ranciere has been so keen to dispute. So Jacques Ranciere kind of undermines this uh, schema. He wants nothing of the alternative that Negri poses between preserving a corner of freedom and embracing the monstrous mutation of powers of capital as our own. He also refuses Badiou's nostalgic invocation of a purified modernism. Uh, Rancière calls it a twisted modernism. As a model for a subtractive practice that seems to lack examples. Instead, Rancière's contention is that if we break with this narrative of real abstraction or real subsumption, as totalizing domination, then we also break with false political alternatives that terminate either in hyper-optimism, as in Negri, or hyper-pessimism, as it seems at times in Beijing. Now, in stating this claim, Rancière wants to pose more room for manoeuvre for the artist, who is not simply trapped in the dialectic of valorization. And I think this is one of the reasons why Rancière is so popular amongst artists uh, and other people. Uh, for Rancière, his thinking is designed, quote, to contrast so-called historical necess necessity with a topography of the configuration of possibilities, a perception of the multiple alter alterations and displacements that make up forms of political subjectivization and artistic invention. So he rejects there's a historical necessity that dictates the fate of the artist or the work. <coughs> and he rejects the philosophical construction of an endlessly dominating capitalism as serving an agenda that flatters the freedom of the philosopher at the expense of the rest of us dupes. This is a side of Rancière, I have got quite a lot of sympathy. You know, if you construct an image of capitalism as totally dominating, you kind of almost accept yourself and everyone else is like, stupid or, or brainwashed or whatever. And I think there is something to that point. He argues that politics has not been eliminated by an atonal capitalism and isn't left to the Spinoza's practice of the multitude, but is an art. And again, this is why it's probably appealing to artists. Precisely an aesthetic of dissensus. Attempts a deliberate disruption of accepted roles, social stratifications, and <laughs> raining on my parade, and arrangements. Uh, a way of reconstructing, to quote him, the relationship between places and identities, spectacles and gazes, proximities and distances. It is, to use the, the title of an interview from which I'm quoting, an art of the possible. In this way, we can see in Rancière a reworking of scale. Capitalism is scaled down from an all-encompassing mechanism of capture, but also the demands of political art for the fusion of art and life, as you get in classical avant-garde, are scaled down as well. So art is scaled down and, and capitalism is. His suggestion is that not the possible works <coughs> between these two fusionary locations. You know, capitalism kind of fuses art into capitalism, and the avant-garde fuses art into life. He wants to create a, a kind of tense space between the two. Now, one of the problems uh, with this position is that it kind of echoes, for me anyway, Cold War tropes 
of the rejection of the totalitarian for the freedom of non-political art. Think of that kind of abstract expressionists and the way their work was positioned. It also echo, echoes recent Latourian, that Bruno Latour, uh, valorizations of the network and the reticular as a site in between grand abstractions, and the celebration of the modest minor freedoms of relational art in the work of Bouillard and others. Rancière, strike notably, I think, adopts the pervasive contemporary trope, one that really annoys me, uh, of rejecting critique as, uh, as always flawed. But he put, does it put it in quite an amusing way. He says, if there is a circulation that should be stopped at this point, it's the circulation of stereotypes that critique stereotypes, giant stuffed animals that denounce our infantilization, media images that denounce the media, spectacular installations that denounce the spectacle, etc. Now I think the problem here is not that Rodsi hasn't got a point, but he blunts the question of critique by dismissing it entirely and then constraining the true merit of critique to the role of refiguration, reworking existing elements, which functions as a kind of stand-in for what critique used to be. Uh, in his formulation, the aim of the artist in art is to, quote, to discover how to produce forms for the presentation of objects, uh, forms for the organisation of sp spaces that thwart expectations. And I mean, this is such a kind of minimal that doesn't seem to me to give you very much of a politics. Thwarting people's expectations uh, is not necessarily correct. Um, so again, the role of the art and the artist is scaled down, but at the same time, the possibilities of art are scaled up. In Rancière's dissensus model, artistic valorization finds its power in disruption, rearrangement, and the thwarting of political expectations. Whether these come from existing power arrangements or the formulation of counterpowers. Resisting what he sees as the automatic nature of Negri's dialectic and the pessimism of Badiou's condemnation of capitalist nihilism, Rancière retains a qualified faith in the possibility of the artist or the artist's work, prefiguring the uh, disruption that is socially characteristic of what he calls communist motives. Again, I'd just like to point out there's actually still more in common between Rancière and his antagonists than you might at first think. Obviously, they disagree about the, the narrative of capitalism, but all three share a dissatisfaction with any pedagogic hyperpolitical art, in a way, uh, which is often couched in a critique or an historicizing distance from the avant garde of the 1920s. But my suspicion is it probably reflects a more local rejection of the reinvention of such projects in the 1960s and 1970s. A certain wariness or, or, or discomfort with the situation is in particular, I think, is a kind of sign of this, this problem. So what we witness then, I think, with all of them, is a waning belief in the political power or necessity of art, although this is coupled in Rancière's case to the reinvention of an art of reconfiguration. Therefore, what I'm suggesting is, while appearing to be more hopeful, or even to use the horrible word, empowering, uh, Rancière's thinking falls again within a certain degree of pessimism or wariness concerning the paradox of valorization and the power of the artist. In fact, I think Rossi actually turns the screw even further um, by taking on board this kind of idea that the valorization of critique is itself consonant with capitalism. So he, he objects to kind of political art that are really just serving capitalism. Uh, and his solution of this kind of reconfiguration is, is drastically limited. While at the same time, which I think is even more problematic, it leaves the horizon of capitalism as largely untheorized and undetermined. Yeah. So that's why everyone else is wrong. <laughs> now I am wrong as well. Uh, <clears throat> so I canvassed uh, these different theoretical solutions to the paradox of valorization, while obviously indicating that I'm skeptical about each. Uh, but I think you know, the fact that they all indicate the same problem is obviously key. And I think the point is that there is a problem and it, it resists a solution, dialectical or otherwise. What I think is important though is to kind of question the way the problem is posed. And I think this is where it's kind of the theoretical thinking of, of thinking can do some use. I think one of the points uh, that I would take from Rancière, though, 
disagree with him in the result, is that our narrative of capitalism is crucial for our thinking about this paradox. You know, in a way, what, you know, to, to adapt kind of all kind of, you know, if you tell me what you think about capitalism, then I can tell you what you might think about art, or the role of the artist. Um, the difficulty I find with Rancière, it's quite an obvious one, is that the problem of this narrative of capitalism is just delighted uh, by, firstly, by his long durée characterization of art in terms of the ascetic regime, which is constituted in the late 18th and the early 19th centuries. You know, if you read Rancière, it's like everything that we're doing today is still belongs to this ascetic regime. There was never anything really called modernism, there's never anything really called postmodernism, they're just kind of variants of this uh, romantic uh, regime. <coughs> Um, uh, I think this is problematic because although we might dispute Negri's periodization of capitalism and art in terms of real subsumption and Badiou's periodization of the short 20th century, at least they tried to periodize the relationship between capitalism and art. And I think this is what uh, Rancière doesn't do. Uh, and in case of Rancière, it seems to me that capitalism dropped out completely. Really. Uh, this is even worse. From my point of view, in the in the kind of in his thinking of the political is dissent, it's in a book like Disagreement, where the political is defined kind of always the Greeks from then to now in terms of this model of dissent. So you, I think it seems to like a purchase on history. Um, so that's a that's a problem. Now I think at least Rancière cited deflationary approach to art in the interview that I've been mainly quoting from, uh, he does at least recognise which I think is important that artists need a job, and some sort of employment within capitalism, because I think a, no one's wanting, you know, there's a danger of kind of purity argument. Um, what I think is a problem is that Rancière persists in misframing the operations of capital to inflate political and artistic capacities. So I don't think he really grasps the, the way capitalism functions. In a sense, Badiou's fraught articulation of subtraction, which all too often risks uh, coinciding with the usual consolations of enclave theory that we can form a little space free of it, at least recognises the power of capitalism and the need to get free of it. In fact, despite its problem problematic reliance on the quasi-Christian model of transfiguration, Negri's immersive model, I'm thinking of Conrad's, Joseph Conrad's great line, in the destructive element, immerse yourself, at least figures of constructive or critical engagement with the real abstractions of capitalism. Despite the seeming magical thinking of reversal, Negri's punk realism, unelaborated as it is, tries to configure a necessity in a continuing moment of defeat that has not passed. Uh, as Alberto Toscano summarizes, quote, the quandary of art in the postmodern world would thus lie for Negri in the invention of an unprecedented realism a non-representational realism capable of re-articulating the present into something other than a system of global indifference. Of course, the question then is, what would that look like? I don't know. Okay, just coming to the end. Uh, what is crucial to note is the paradox that although these theorists all qualify or contest the pedagogic avant-garde and call for alternatives, mutation, subtraction and dissensus, within contemporary art practice there has been more appreciation of the pedagogic avant-garde as an option still open if requiring reinvention. The response to the quandary Negri poses, and which in different ways form Rancière and Badiou, has been through the avant-garde and onto a realism not regarded as antagonistic to that legacy. For example, to use a very well-known example, the work of Alan Sekula, which integrates Brechtian montage with Lukacian realism. Therefore, there has been an historical engagement with the experience of abstraction and of defeat that may be less heroic, but is perhaps more patient in terms of the possibilities that operate in the present. That's not to say that the temptation to valorize the revolutionary value of art is still not present in problematic fashions. In a sense, some of the realism that might be regarded as necessary also requires an engagement with the constraints and limits of the present. And the guarantee of political bona fides should not be sought in the referencing of the past avant-garde as if that solved our problem. So this is the real tension and kind of reinvention problem. Uh, of course, advice to artists is a perilous, although popular, genre. So I'm going to try to give and not give advice. Um, what I think is that we need to pose and think the problem of value <clears throat> in order to confront and think our situation. 
And that said, especially in terms of the function of the abstract. Uh, to quote Adorno, those who create works which are truly concrete and indissoluble, truly antagonistic to the sway of culture, industry, and calculative manipulation, who those who think most severely and intransigently in terms of technical consistency. And this, I think, is a nice and open formulation if you leave aside Adorno's own aesthetic choices, which I think we can. Um, and I think this is a useful sense of engaging with something like what Negri might call a punk realism might be. Uh, why it might be read as simply suggesting the path to the concrete is attention to the concrete of technical means, I think this is far too simple a reading, but far simpler than Adorno's own reflection. Instead, it means that the concrete cannot simply be reached as is, but only through a process of mediation and engagement with abstraction. Adorno poses this problem in terms of philosophy. Quote, because concreteness has vanished in a society whose law condemns all human relations to abstractness, philosophy wants desperately to evoke concretion without conceding the meaninglessness of existence, but also without being fully absorbed into it. Adorno had in mind here phenomenology, but you don't have to look too far today, uh, just to look at speculative realism, to see in the way in which this desire for the concrete still operates. Uh, and not only that. And so that's what I'm saying is that the, the kind of particular way in which abstractions function lead us to a desire for concrete, but we can't just jump to the concrete magically. And so we're just straight there. You know, can't just go straight to objects and ignore the problem of commodities. And so the two are completely uh, different. Uh, because the jumping to the concrete without mediation simply results in another abstraction. The concrete itself becomes an abstraction. You know, we want concreteness, it becomes abstract. Uh, and Adorno, uh, reflecting on Benjamin, who he had some kind of critical remarks about this, but in this case, uh, uh, Claude says, you know, what Benjamin does is add materialist salt to the object by saying that the object is inherently socially mediated, i.e. recognising that the object is a commodity. And I think it's here, in this realism of the abstract, that I think a critical engagement with the paradox of valorisation lies. Not least because I think such a paradox is rooted in the paradox of abstract labour itself. Thank you. So please, questions, commentaries. People don't ask questions, I always think it implies they agree with me. <laughs> you may think that's a dangerous thing. Singular that cannot be uh, uh, subsumed to to um, uh, to capital in sense yes. of value to add abstraction to, yeah. to so and this is what also Adorno I believe I mean yes. his his insistence on, on art as, as the one and club as, as yes. you said as the one sphere where where uh, there is uh, at least a chance um, to, to to construct a different relation towards towards um, uh, objects or, or whatever so but. Um, the first, the first things. So in that sense, it is like um, a form. The, uh, the aesthetic sphere has uh, seems to uh, to uh, develop parallelly with uh, with the deepening of of uh, of uh, a capitalist uh, of a capitalist uh, subsumption of society and all spheres of society. So one can read it in that sense as a symptom, as a form of compensation. Yeah. So uh, you have the, the genius or the artist as the, as the one authentic subject, autonomous still, 
in a sense, like uh, some uh, sort of um, mystified artisan in, in an age, in, in a historical book where, uh, the, uh, where artisans uh, disappear and so on and so on. But uh, the, first, uh, the first part so if you, uh, is, is, is the one I find, well, in, in the way you put it, I think at least questionable. I would say there is, of course, um, uh, an analogy between uh, capitalist uh, um, strategies of representation, ideological self-representation, in the sense of the Schumpeter, Schumpeter Smith of uh, the entrepreneur as the great um, uh, uh, creator, innovator, and this and that. And one could, uh, I, I, I would say, one could argue plausibly that this is, uh, in a sense, a, a form of um, cooptation of the myth of the, of, of the artist. Uh, or of the genius uh, of, of, of that the whole um, symbolic baggage, uh, romantic uh, or romantic uh, symbolic baggage. But to what extent is it then uh, but, uh, further than that, that beyond that, beyond this as, as a mere strategy of, of ideological uh, representation of capitalism, uh, I don't see I don't see how you could state that um, the artist um, would truly be the subject closest to, to, to capitalism. Yeah, I'm thinking here in terms of uh, the question of value creation and the value form. So, uh, it's something I was also to mention in the Vitalism Conference. Um, you know, Marx has some nice lines, which I keep quoting all the time these days, about you know, those who say, uh, stress the creative power of labour, but I think now that creativity is often figured in artistic terms, which is what I'm saying. Um, you know, that's what capitalism does. You know, they're really reproducing what capitalism does. Capitalism is the transubstantiation, as he puts it, of labour power into, into value. And he says, you know, uh, the critique of the Gotha programme, um, you know, the bourgeoisie has great uh, reasons for flattering the power of labour, because it figures valorisation. And what I think, you know, I know certainly, you know, in uh, the West, in particular cultures, and I'm not saying it's not combined in an even process, because it certainly is, but there are certain models of artistic identity that have been taken up as models for labour more generally. And I think this is a problem that is posed to artists themselves. You know, the, the way in which, because we were talking about funding cuts, mobility, the ability to elicit funding, is the model of the firm. The artist is the enterprise machine. Uh, and working in education, this is the kind of model that we are now being demanded to take. You know, that you, self-fund everything you do. My research should be self-funding, it shouldn't be funded by my university. You know, so I think these kind of models of enterprise, activity, the ability to be flexible, to be creative, are ideologically, but I think in kind of also some ways materially, being incorporated into um, forms of capitalist valorization, particularly around the neoliberal project, which is it's in the UK being re refigured and reworked. So I think there are, um, there is that process. And there's some good, uh, the other thing I'm always quoting is, you know, Walter Benjamin says in the book on Baudelaire that there is a creative ideology. Because the ideology of creativity is that you are detached from the market. Because, you know, you're not directly employed, you know, you're not in a factory or in an office, you're working. But obviously you have to sell what you do to to live. And that in a sense generates this hyper production, this you know, this self-regulating, self-working identity. And I think this again is conformist can conformity with the whole kind of neoliberal project, which is predicated on this of some, you know, on this model of offering you the freedom from you know the terrible ties of employment, you know, in a big firm, you know, the, the, the horror of actually having to work for the state uh, or some kind of body. And trading that for the freedom of mobility, flexibility, working when you like, which means working all the time. You know, um, in education, you know, this takes the form of, in the UK, now this shift towards virtual learning. You know, this, this, the idea that students don't actually want to see lecturers and lecturers don't want to see students. Uh, which speaks to a social truth, but is a horrible thing. But, you know, this is how they get you. You know, I actually like teaching. Uh, I like to see people uh, <laughs> being so kind of old school. Uh, you know, um, you know, I think well, I think there's something to people sitting in a room talking about something that 
that's better than answering 400 emails. Um, you know, but this is the kind of model. So, you know, th this is the kind of creativity, engagement. You know, you can go online anytime. You can get. So, I think there are these. Uh, there are those models. In a sense, the artistic identity. I'm not saying this exhausts it. Obviously, this is what the, the paradox is about. But it proposes a model of creativity and self-exploitation, and gets you to love it. You know, because you're creative. You know, it's that. That's. You know, and I think that's a way of modelling or figuring abstract labour that has, I think, more than ideological resonance. I don't want to... No, I'm sorry, I'm just rambling now. Stop me. <laughs> I don't want to private this debate. I'm all against privatisation. But then, what? <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe one, one follow-up. So it seems this are now, it splits into two separate questions now, yeah. I think. The, the one is, of course, now historically, one can say that um, uh, at one time, capitalism is, is um, representing itself as more artistic and all, all that, and is, mm -hmm. is uh, more actively drawing artistic practices into uh, management and all that. All, all, the, all the stuff you mentioned, uh, yeah. Frank uh, Thomas and, and uh, Botansky and Chapelle mm -hmm. wrote about and all that. So that, in a sense, as, as, uh, so that would be, an, I would say, an accurate uh, description of our historical tendency, the one mm -hmm. we live in now. But, uh, but on the other hand, still, if you say, well, um, labor uh, and but the capital self organization is always to, I mean, value is abstract labor, so mm. embodied abstract labor. And in that sense, the artist, originally at least, seemed like, like a counter model to that kind of labor. Like, it is always concrete and singular and cannot <coughs> be, uh, cannot be um, equalized in the sense uh, there is no ge uh, general equivalent. I mean, that would be uh, the like wager of. of um, <laughs> The mediation yeah, of there, of course, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, always in you know, the mediation of that. I mean, well, that's that, that's what the paradox. When Marco asked me, you know, I mean, it's supposed to take the question in the way you take it, but I thought, you know, this is that is the that's the tension for uh, you know, I'm not, I say I'm not an artist, but I think that would be, you know, that is the tension for an artistic identity. On the one hand, you know, I think it's a problem with people probably like me or non-artists, you know, projecting so much onto artists, you know, which must be very annoying if you're an artist, you know, so much rides on the artists uh, to do the, the kind of figurative work. But, I, you know, I'm not saying, I don't think either model is exhaustive. I'm not saying, on the one hand, artists are completely anti-capitalist, on the other hand, they're completely capitalist. That would be foolish. But what I'm saying is the, the position of the artist, I think, figures this tension. That's the only way I can understand when Marcus said, you know, self-valorization of the artist. I was thinking, well, what, what could that mean? And for me, the one thing that it must mean, you know, is trying to avoid this artist's self-valorization, which, you know, in terms of creativity of work or being able to kind of function as an artist or a human, those two things go together, um, from capitalist value extraction. You know, as the, I think one of the dominant Form. So, you know, that's what I thought when he's, when Marcus said, you know, how would you, that must be the tension if you want, you know, to change the world we live in, obviously, you can, you know, I don't know, I don't, I could only pick on the usual suspects, usual suspects, but, you know, if you don't care, then, <laughs> then you plug yourself valorization into to money. But I think it's that, it's, sorry, it's the other thing is, I think there is, it's the way we conceptualize capitalism. And I think there is some interesting, partly what I was talking about the weekend, I think it's that mediating function of things like money that we must be very careful to kind of grasp. Because it, on the one hand, lots of things we do aren't determined by capitalism, you know, in a kind of simple way. But the way capitalism operates does kind of work on lots of things we do at the same time. So, you know, when I go swimming in the sea, I have to pay, uh, you know. So it's if, you know it's it's not capitalist, but I have to pay for the swimming trunks I'm wearing. You know, otherwise, I'd be arrested. Uh, you know, I have to pay for the beach towel. You know, you have to pay for the. So I think it's you know I, I'm kind of interested in thinking the way we can figure this value of form and these abstractions as they operate. That's neither you know nightmarish totalitarian dominance, although sometimes feels like that, or you know creativity is always resistant because. In a way, it's an obvious way, creativity is always resistant, or thinking is always resistant, but it's how it gets captured, sucked in, conforms, 
that is a kind of political question, I think, to me. But, Um, I think uh, if we speak in socioeconomic uh, terms, um, we know at least two models uh, of economy in the arts, one being the market, other being uh, public institutions. Um, and I guess much of the art world is situated somewhere between the two. Um, I think that a lot of talk about artists being the neoliberal subject has to do with, uh, with uh, visual arts and uh, individual form of creation that is typical to uh, visual arts. But uh, I mean, it, it's also not a historic novelty, so to say. It's, it's uh, when, when you look at the internal history uh, of the production form in visual arts, uh, it's not a late capitalist development, strictly. Um, so that's kind of first comment or question. Mm -hmm. And other comment, again, um, um, where would you position theory in terms of valorization uh, in the arts, because I think that theory increasingly plays the role of valorization, particularly in, in visual arts where uh, market and valuation is kind of an interface between individuals and uh, institutions. And um, to my mind, theory creates a framework where a certain valorization uh, can unfold. Yeah, uh, glad you asked both. Um, the historical novelty thing, yeah, I think is 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 true um, because, like I suppose, Benjamin talking about Baudelaire, uh, poet and <coughs> writer, not visual artist, but you know, in a sense, so I think there are there are continuities and. Um, You know, I mean, this is my kind of uh, my problem uh, because you know, kind of analysing the problems with other people, <laughs> then you have to kind of face the problems yourself, isn't it? And try and get them displaced onto someone else. But I think there is a lot more to be done about this historical tracing of that continuities. Um, certainly, like the, like I said in the talk with Thomas Frank book about the conquest of cool about art and advertising and things like that. It's very interesting for me about this parallel discourse and. Um, Obviously, people like T.J. Clark have written a lot about visual arts in these kind of ways. So I think, you know, I don't. I agree with you personally that it's it's probably not an historical novelty uh, uh, per se. Although I think, in some ways, some of the contemporary figurations of labour and some of the contemporary uh, neoliberal models generate uh, new ways of working that. Also, I, you know, I mean, I, I see your point about visual art, but I think also the kind of emphasis on networks and collectivities in neoliberalism uh, brings in other art forms as well, perhaps more strongly than, than they were before, in terms of this is, you know, the kind of whole work team model, uh, the creative team. Uh, so I think that there is something about the contemporary moments also engaging with these kind of networks. You know, as firms themselves become kind of multimedia platforms, they're kind of, I think it's again, it's kind of a difficult uh, problem. Sorry, that's a bit wrong. Uh, theory, yes, theory is part of the problem. <laughs> Not necessarily part of the solution. Um, no, theory performs, uh, as we were talking about just before, I mean, a very <coughs> powerful uh, role in the valorization of art. Uh, and the valorization of art to the market and to the state, but to funding, to money. Um, yeah, one of the kind of amusing things Negri says is that he wrote uh, his letters on art for money. He started writing on art because he could make some money, he needed the money uh, at the time. Um, and as we know, well, I've heard, you know, that writing catalogue texts, introductions, pays a lot more than 
one would make as a theorist from writing a book. Royalty rates on books are so low unless you sell thousands and thousands of copies. Um, so um, there is a mutual valorization to every artist is theorist. To you know, uh, this is this is the model. Um, yeah, theory is in no way accepted from <coughs> from paradoxes of valorization. Uh, in what I'm saying, I think I, it's partly what I like about Ranciere in a way. But you know, there's no, I don't think there's a point being a kind of moralist or a purist about this, but developing a kind of critique of it. Um, and I think, well, I think, yeah, I think of what, you know, theory and art, I think need, yeah, I mean, both need to think through this problem. Sorry, that's very vague, but I think there is, it, it, it rebounds back. Uh, and it needs to be re reworked. Sorry, is that, um, I feel like I've answered those questions. Yeah, okay. Try again. Um, yeah, I have a question about the relation between not just uh, self valorization of the artist um, and the problem of political art, but also uh, just the relation between um, artistic practice and political practice per se. Mm -hmm. so there, it seems to me that as long as, um, you know, if we have a kind of theory of real subsumption, we think that we live in a historical period in which, you know, our lives are really subsumed by capital, not only formally, then, you know, most of the analyses of that will tell us that any kind of, for the most part, you know, intellectual activity, artistic activity, creative activity, even affective relations are subsumed by capital. Now, we don't have to say that, like, they're entirely subsumed by capital. There's no outside of capital whatsoever. You know, of course, like activity is and is not subsumed by capital to different degrees and different ways. But, uh, but it seems to me like the problem of art is the same as as any other practice or activity in that sense. And um, and so then for me at least the question shifts to what's the relation between you know making art and artistic practice and just doing politics or political practice, political activity, as something which doesn't necessarily have to have any relation whatsoever to theoretical production or to artistic production. Um, the same person can be an artist and they can also have a political practice and it wouldn't necessarily have to be that much you know, of a relation or connection between them, although there might be some consistency. And so uh, to ask a question, you know, the question for me is more like less um, what to do with the political practice of artistic activity when it's really subsumed by capital. But one of, uh, the interesting question is when um, one has a political practice, you know, when that becomes sort of like artistic, or when that becomes performative, that is to say when politics, uh, political activities is subsumed by art, or subsumed by performativity. And my question would be, like, if we reverse the problem, how to think about the relation of politics and art from that other angle? You know, is political action performative? Is it artistic? And is it a problem when it's actually subsumed by a model practice which comes from the arts or from creativity? Um, so if we like flip the problem and look at it that way, if we say it's actually desirable, that is, to have a kind of split between art and politics. And the problem may come to uh, when, when uh, politics becomes actually like a pseudo-artistic practice. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I have no idea. <laughs> Again, I think it's you know, kind of low to set any general rules on how to do politics uh, because I'm not really doing much myself. So, you know, I think it is it has to be kind of worked out or like being done to an extent. Um, and again, you know, the kind of aestheticization of politics <coughs> arguments as Benjaminian reference their runs kind of cut in very, very different ways depending on what you're doing. I mean, there's a certain kind of minimal you know, or if you take a Ranciere line, you know, the political is aesthetic, because the political is about 
configurations and rearrangements, so therefore it's, That's kind of it, exactly is, what I mean. it is aesthetics. Um, I suppose my kind of general point is I think I'm, I'm not particularly convinced by arguments about the autonomy of the political or, you know, in a kind of grand way, the same way. Uh, what I'm interested in kind of thinking is the relation between the political, and, or in this case the artistic, and its forms and the forms of value or the forms of real abstraction, because I think that's where the problems start to become difficult. So, um, I don't, you know, I wouldn't be... Uh, In a way, you know, I think that you, the, the kind of autonomy of the political is something to be achieved rather than given. Uh, and that has to be achieved through particular forms of struggle rather than being given by a, a kind of theorization that the political is just autonomous because that's what political is in a kind of circular way. Um, I mean, personally, I'm, just because it's personal, take kind of suspicious of or not necessarily convinced by the aesthetic forms of the political. Uh, you know, I'm not against the, the relation of the aesthetic and the political, but I think the kind of immediate leap to aestheticize political activity seems to me problematic as immediately you know, politicizing the aesthetic. So I think, uh, you know, I think again, I would, uh, you know, this is what I'm saying, I suppose, <coughs> it's reworking those, those relationships. You know, I think just invoking the, the avant-garde, you know, invoking the moments when those two seem to fuse is not sufficient. Because one of the other, the other things is, is when you look at moments where it seemed that the political and artistic did fuse, you, what you find is a far more complicated and messy story than it appears in the way people talk about it. You know, if you look at the, I mean, I'm not a historical expert, but you know, look at the Soviet avant-garde, for example, you know, one of those most surprising things, at least about kind of the writers, is how few of them are communists, per se. Or certainly not Bolshevists, you know, but are not a major exception. You know, so there are kind of strange, you know, there are others, but, you know, there are often different kinds of political identification going on with a project, different kinds of political articulation. So, and I think this is true of a lot of the 60s, which I'm a bit more familiar with. You know, there's, there's a complex, um, political articulation here that, that in retrospect becomes aestheticized because we but at the time I think is more complicated and, and <coughs> difficult. For exactly the same because people aren't stupid. <laughs> people are aware that the danger that their political practice will just become an aesthetic, uh, you know, how to actually do politics or actually do aesthetics without it simply becoming reduced to politics. So I think people are trying to think through those problems. Um, I wish I had a better answer to <laughs> How to do it, but um, I think I think it's very difficult. Okay, I have one uh, comment or mm -hmm. question. Uh, because at first, uh, it seems to me it's always uh, these unsolvable problems on philosophical level are uh, usually unsolvable because they are philosophical problems, mm -hmm. especially when the capitalism is included. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Really, you cannot say anything about capitalism in philosophical category. It's really impossible. Uh, so I think that these three usual suspects in the contemporary uh, theory that you're talking about, that they somehow, they, uh, they do not produce theory. They somehow uh, are taking the place of the artist. But I think that they are producing some kind of artistic statement. With all, uh, with all the, with their theory of, uh, of, of art, with, with, in, as, as you said, there is no uh, concrete example which, on which they can refer and say this is what we talk about. And especially if you uh, uh, locate that, uh, their position in the historical narrative uh, of the left, of the Marxist left, that, uh, at the 20s and 30s you have this first explosion of cultural uh, analysis in Frankfurt School because of the specific historical reason that uh, German Revolution uh, didn't take place, and they, they are trying to solve the ideological and cultural, cultural problems of its uh, absence. And uh, then you have the 68 and all the, uh, the, uh, the problems, and you have the 
uh, two levels of de uh, detachment from the uh, concrete political activity and uh, revolutionary uprising. The first one was the theory, uh, but is still somehow related, and the other one uh, functions as autonomy, autonomous theory, which really somehow functions uh, as art in itself. And uh, also the the other what we are talking about aesthetics and, and uh, politics, I think that the way we retrospectively uh, frame the narrative of the political art uh, in, the, in the 20th century, uh, what really likes, likes to do is uh, a proper, as you uh, said before, proper historical perspective, because uh, you can only trace this some kind of the Ethics, political ethics of certain artistic practice in a concrete historical geographical situation when you when you have when in which you have a really political uprising. You know, when you have 30% of people voting for the uh, uh, Communist Party, of course that that uh, art works which are engaged with that kind of political uh, political stance uh, will have uh, will be more visible and have more ethics on the on the Public, public imagining, but when in a situation of 30 years after uh, neoliberal country revolution, you have no uh, no proper uh, political subject uh, to con confront that country revolution, the, the artistic uh, experiments which try to, in whatever sense, to mystify uh, the ideological process in urbanism or, or whatever, like that um, political background of the political subject which, which can. Uh, put them on the on the proper political level. So I think that there is not you cannot uh, retrace the somehow uh, uh, inter, uh, in, in work of art uh, somehow its its <coughs> uh, uh, methods or or, or uh, methods of procedures or something like that which are which are inherent politi political but their political efforts are always uh, and, and I think only is, uh, could be produced in relation to the already existing political uh, serious political subject. Yeah. Um, <coughs> someone rather distressingly pointed out to be in a review of my book. You know, it's if you think it's really about capitalism. Why aren't you any populist? You know? Why aren't you doing that? Um, uh, you know, so in a sense, the autonomy, you know, I don't understand your question, Mark, but you know, posing problems at this level of abstraction doesn't generate any kind of useful answer. Um, I, well, you know, I, I don't know whether it's my constitutive incapacity to do anything but theory uh, <laughs> or, you know, but I, I mean, you know, I mean, the paper is predicated on that. I think there is something to be gained through a kind of theoretical reflection in posing, yeah, in correctly posing the problem. Yeah, that's and I think no, no. I mean, I think your question was very good because I, I mean, it's kind of back to what Tom's saying. Other people are saying. I mean, you know, um, it's a really, it is a, it is a problem because if you say, you know, as I've just been doing, you know, it's all historical, it's political, well, then the obvious rejoinder, and it's. It's a correct place. Why don't you go do some history and some politics? And do read a lot, but you know, if, it, if that becomes a problem, there is a kind of dissolution of the theoretical moment. The theoretical becomes uh, utterly irrelevant and subsumed by a whole load of other discourses. I mean, I think I actually trained as a social scientist, so I have some familiarity with some empirical. Uh, and they're never as quite as empirical as you believe. You know, and I mean, I think there is. You know, I mean, the, you know, that's a kind of usual, typical reply, but I don't think it's a, a false reply. Is that those disciplines themselves, you know, have theoretical valences. Uh, you know, the theory, theoretical way you identify political sequence, for example. You know, I mean, uh, I can't remember who was telling me, but you know, the kind of revisionist history that you're experiencing, which we've been experiencing in the UK. You know, we the most stunning fact that we did once uh, cut the head off our king. Uh, in 1649, I think. Uh, you know, generally forgotten in British culture um, for some reason. Uh, Luke Hatch has a great remark. You know, the problem with the, the, the English Revolution it was too early. <laughs> we jumped too fast. Uh, 
slid back. Um, so, so I think you know there are kind of theoretical ways to engage with these problems, and are necessary, I think, still to engage with. Also, I, I am tempted to say, which I sort of partly try to say in the book, that there is a certain way in capitalism itself operates at a kind of theoretical or metaphysical or philosophical level. In some of these forms of real abstraction, which obviously have been you know, kind of present in some ways since the start, and you know, I don't totally buy into a real subsumption argument that you know, being combined in uneven development, etc. But some of the ways in which capitalism itself operates, I think, are kind of transcendental or metaphysical. And I think, in a way, philosophical or, I mean, I don't think myself as a philosopher, theoretical thought, I think, is a useful way to pose or understand that, that level. And I think without that level, then, well, I think that just that level would take place anyway. You know, even if we turned around and said, well, you know, we'd all become historians, economists, um, analysts at that level, we'd end up doing some kind of theoretical work with that, because we would be engaged with those sort of problems. Is so is that what you meant? Yeah, of, course, of, course, of course, we have uh, a theoretical framework, we can do an empty uh, uh, But our point is suggesting that, hmm. uh, that there is no, uh, no uh, kind of trade-off between empirical investigation and, uh, and the theoretical uh, framework. Because the proper theoretical framework you can only get if you do some kind of just to put it in, in, in proper historical context is already a, a theoretical adjustment. Yeah. You well, know, I said because uh, just a critical <coughs> the theoretical position. Of course, I do that all the all the time. But the theoretical position is such, but but uh, there's some this kind of purity of theoretical. Yeah, but it's just. <coughs> Yeah, I can answer. And then, you know, yeah, I mean, I agree. It's very difficult to do. You know, this is what I'm saying. It's the, I was jokingly joking myself about the problem of mediation. <laughs> it's very difficult to do. You know, it, I try to do it in the book in some way identifying with certain the theoretical maneuvers with uh, the 1970s, 1973. You know, the kind of Robert Brenner capitalism start on its decline, which is not practically visible at that point, but becomes more visible with the financial crisis of 2008. So. But you know, Badiou would say the same. You know, Badiou would say he identifies sequences of thought. Negri would say identify sequences of thought. You know, they're all saying that in that. You know, so again, I think there has to be some. It doesn't have to be a theoretical process, but it does have to be analysis and interrogation. It can also be in terms of intellectual history, because you know, this is the problem of mediation. There is there autonomy, including in art. You know, there. Are, you know, that's why I kind of you know, this is a, to put it simply, some kind of teach literature, you know, the problem of Tristan Shandy in English literature. It's the first postmodern novel. It does virtually everything that postmodern novels are supposed to do. It's unfortunately, it's published in the late 18th century, you know, far before. So, you know, I agree with you, but I think that's what I was trying to do here, is play off these different competing paradigms so we can perhaps see the different things at stake. But, you know, I mean, I have my, obviously, preferences, and I think there's some arguments that I Sustain for that, but I think, in a sense, theoretical reflection for anyone, uh, and it is, you know, I totally agree with Francia, you know, everyone thinks, I love that statement, you know, everyone theoretically reflects, is to assess those processes and also to share knowledge. For that. Um, since you just mentioned that capitalism working in metaphysical ways, mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious to ask you um, about the, the stuff you're already going to do at the end of the talk. Mm. Uh, about people trying to make objects and all this, and you suggested you need to engage on that level with um, value or thinking value and all mm. this. I was just wondering if you had anything in particular in mind. Do you have some ideas about that, or if you were just. Uh, I'm getting recorded. Um, <laughs> 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 not because I'm worried about what I'm going to say, but just because. Just be honest. Um, no, I prefer. I suppose I. The one thing that uh, Margaret Thatcher said that I ever regard as quotable uh, is, um, although when she, what she said it about wasn't, uh, but was denying the oxygen of publicity, which is a phrase I quite like. Um, so I think there are some things, that theoretically or politically or critically, that I like not to talk about, um, because I think 
you talk about something, she can become involved with them uh -huh. in some admiring fashion. Uh, but what I would say is, at the most at the level I said it in the paper, if you are wanting to reflect on objects, whether there are objects or philosophical objects, I think what's interesting about a number of contemporary theorizations, to pick that most general point, is that they reproduce uh, the ideology of the value form in actually a way that's very unmediated, it's almost directly transparent. Uh, a number of what they, people call flat ontologies uh, imply that all objects are equivalent, because you know, it's flat, there's no particular privilege to any object and also focus on the singularity of particular objects as being very important and kind of irreducible. And that seems to me the, the, that's the value form, that's the commodity. That's what commodities are. Commodities are exchangeable, so they're flat, they're all equivalent. Everything can be bought or sold. Uh, at the same time, they're entirely kind of singular in particular ways, you know, this is the way ideology works. It must be, you know, this commodity rather than that. So I think, um, and, uh, and again, I mean, in, in terms of the paper, uh, and more generally, which I, you know, just interested in thinking about, is this desire for the concrete and the way in which people talk about things that are concrete. And I, I have just uh, sometimes hard time understanding why particular things are concrete. To take a, you know, my field, um, English literature. There's a huge fashion uh, in the UK for talking about, you know, clocks, tables, maps, <laughs> uh, you know, anything but literature. Uh, all those things in literature, you know. Uh, and it's called materials, you know, it's, it's material. You know, um, I'm not just going to be a kind of total derogate, but I think it's, you know, it, it takes a bit more than that, you know, this kind of, it, it, and it has all these connotations of hard edge, you know, it's real world stuff. <laughs> because obviously, you know, most human beings struggle to engage with fiction because, you know, reading novels is frankly boring. And, but, you know, if you were to talk about, you know, kind of uh, chocolate or tea or dresses or, uh, you know, the design of rooms, this is, this is material stuff that people can really relate to, you know, and it has, you know, interest in, you know, I mean, these are the kind of research agendas that are proposed. Um, so again, I think there's, there's a kind of misplacing of the concrete and the material. You know, materialist, probably gets used badly by me, but, you know, materialist and material and concrete, everyone loves it. You know, everything today must be historical, material, concrete, preferably in a network, you know, uh, and, you know, this is, it, I mean, sorry, just one point, I mean, it, you know, it does, because I did come into like literary, teaching literature late, but it just strikes me as a completely crazy move if you're teaching literature, because we, we're basic with this, it's fiction, it's not real in some way. <laughs> and this is what's really interesting about fiction, you know, and I think, but that's, a, that's another, sound like a Russian formula still, I quite like, but that's, that's another argument. So. Wait, so the, mm. I'm being flippant. Yeah, no, no, but that's the first part of what you're saying about the slime and all that. Mm. I mean, describing the, the general equivalence, right? Of, mm. You're saying they describe the value form. But insofar as that, that actually is a real existing reality that has transformed things, yes. you know, to actually be, you know, yes. equivalent in that way, yeah. then is it important to be able to think that adequately, theoretically? In yeah, that's why I think, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's a terribly problematic category, and, you know, uh, you know it's the real abstraction or practical abstraction, you know, there's a huge debate, you know, I'm not, I'm not closest reader of Marx, Marx uses something like practical abstraction or real abstraction. I think that at least to me just captures something of that problem. I'm not saying stop thinking the concrete or material, you know, or, 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 but I'm saying let's, you know, I think the ways of invoking the concrete and material as if it's a kind of established fact. I mean, even if people talk about it in really complicated you know, ways, I think it seems to me to miss something of this level. I mean, actually that does relate to fiction, I mean, you know, Whatever people think, you know, and I think Zizek's points about the kind of social structure and power of fiction, or Lacan's points, if you prefer, you know, are also congruent with what 
Marx's analysis of capital are. You know, there is something to those these media mediatory forms themselves that need to be thought, and I think often get kind of jumped over or collapsed or hey, or whatever. But you know, I think that so this is my <coughs> my suspicion. And also, it goes along with a a particular kind of, what well, I think of it as rhetoric, but you know, other people may not, because I'm not, you know, not, um, well, it wouldn't matter if I worked, because people would just carry on doing what they always do. Um, but I think, you know, the demand for on, ontologies, the demand for, you know, return to metaphysics, I, I kind of have problems with in some ways. I think it's, it produces things that are very difficult to kind of um, engage with. You know, it seems to return to, to a certain way of doing philosophy that I consider kind of quite strange, uh, not, in a, not in, a, in a good way. Um, yes. Maybe I can ask a question that's somewhat uh, related to to the last point, but to shift it back in terms of uh, your discussion of Ranciere, and in particular the sort of, the moment that in, in some sense you wanted to, to affirm in a qualified way, mm -hmm. namely his critique of critique. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I too have always been, I've always found that moment rather, rather interesting, and it's precisely because I think what he identifies is how a certain form of, of critical discourse, which situates the artwork in this utopian position of being precisely outside of, let's say, the, the value form, Pro reproduces the very structure of the value form, but yet in, in an inverted manner. So that now, in other words, the failure of the artwork to escape the value form becomes this sort of question of, of melancholia, mm. right? which I think is the sort of what, in some sense, the, what Ranciere is, is trying to criticize. In other words, I don't, I don't think the point is to say, to sort of try to abandon the critical gesture, mm. but resituate it in such a way as to say that, okay, of course we can accept the fact that every artwork is a commodity. Mm. It, it's, I mean, it's absurd to sort of claim that, that the artwork isn't one. Um, but at the same time, what one should call into question is the, precisely the demand that the artwork shouldn't be a commodity. Mm. That in other words, one should think Precisely what I mean, what is interesting about art is that it can actually, in a reflective way, deal with the fact that it is a commodity, yeah. which, in other words, other commodities don't do in the marketplace. Yeah. So I guess I'm kind of curious how um, you, you, I mean, what you, what you think about that sort of reading, maybe, of Ramsier's gesture. Yeah, when you're saying that, I was thinking um, one of the many people I'm not a good enough reader of, or I haven't read enough of, is Adorno, but you know. At the moment, um, Stuart Martin has a good article about Adorno's concept of the artwork as absolute commodity. You know, the artwork is the absolute commodity. It's actually kind of like this paradox again, but you know, in its absoluteness of its commodity form, it kind of figures the end of the commodity. So, you know, because it's so absolute, it stands out outside. I was thinking of that when you were saying. But no, I agree with you. I think. Um, I think that's the kind of rethinking and critique that needs to take place, you know, rather than, you know, I think that is what Ranciere is aiming to do. Uh, you know, he's not. I think there's just dangers in some of the ways he kind of formulates that critique, but it seems to align it with this general, more general reluctance of critique. You know, I mean, I think, you know, what do I think? Um, always a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, again, there's a kind of danger of reconstructing practices as critique in ways that they just weren't. You know, taking the situations, uh, situations as an example, because I kind of know they work quite well, you know, the situationists are, are not the kind of critique that virtually everyone says they are. Because De Boer was a filmmaker. This little acknowledged fact, as he puts it, you know. Um, and he makes, you know, why, you know, he makes films because, as he says, cinema is utterly mendacious. 
you know, that there is something in the way you can work with images. So it's not it just he hates images, you know, which is the way often these sort of kind of critiques get taken, you know, it's just you hate everything, you know. Critical people just don't like anything. You know, you, you're always criticizing. <laughs> Sorry, you, you might get the impression that I get told this myself. But, uh, which is true. Um, but I think, you know, there is a kind of critique. Their critiques are more involved precisely in that kind of analysis of the way in which critique can, can turn around and reinforce problems. But I think the danger of leaping to a kind of a-critical position. Bruno Latour is the worst for this. He constructs critique in such a horrible way. And this is also my kind of anxiety generally about what I call affirmationism. Is that it tends to think, I think, re misrepose the question of critique. Um, uh, it's dangerous. Okay, no more questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. <laughs>